Hello, hello everyone. Sorry that we are starting late. We had some technical issues to deal with, um, but we are ready to go. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give us get us started since we're running a little bit behind. Um, just a bit of housekeeping for you. Um, many of you might want to sort of watch what we talk about today, or you might have a colleague who registered but was unable to attend live. Um, this webinar will be recorded, and everyone who registered will receive a follow-up email with that recording. Um, that email will also include a certificate of attendance, um, any other resources that we've used or discussed in this webinar. Um, so don't feel like you need to take notes or screenshots. You know, you'll get access to all of it after that. Um, there's also a Q&A box open to you. Take a moment to find it. If you have a question for the speakers, feel free to use that box. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on it. Um, and if we ask you any prompts, that is also where uh, we'll be monitoring for your responses. Um, for those of you who don't know much about Teachstone's mission, uh, we are really about helping every child reach their full potential. And we do that by observing and measuring the interactions between teacher and child, and then working with teachers, with coaches, with administrators to help them improve on those interactions with their children and with their colleagues uh, when necessary. Um, so far, we've fulfilled this mission with educators in all 50 states and uh, around the globe, um, but we know there's still a lot of work to do, right? And that's why we're really excited to have conversations like the one that we're having today. Um, so again, thank you for spending your time with us. Um, all right, I am going to pass it over to our wonderful speakers today, Sophia and Veronica, to introduce themselves. Thank you, Gloria. Hi, everybody. My name is Sofia Rodriguez. I am a client implementation specialist here at Teachstone. I've been with Teachstone for a couple of years now. I'm originally from Lima, Peru and living in Virginia. And I've seen how amazing it is just to interact with different organizations, teachers, and just get to see the impact that we have on early childhood education. Uh, so I'm very happy and thrilled to be here. And actually, um, I'm very thrilled to introduce Veronica Fernandez. She's on the line as well. Veronica, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, hello, my name is uh, Veronica Fernandez. I'm a developmental psychologist and research scientist at the University of Miami. I've been working in early childhood for a very long time. My mom had a child care center when I was very young, so I've been in this world for a long time. Um, then studied education, worked as a classroom teacher, and then I was a curriculum specialist and co-director for several years at a center. Then went back to the university and got a master's and a PhD in developmental psychology and have been engaged in work that focuses around teacher-child interaction quality and improving the experiences of young children. My journey with class began actually in, in 2009, which was my first year of graduate school when I initially got trained in the pre-K class. And we've been using it in research studies and in implementation work as well with teachers in the community. I just want to apologize that my camera is not working, so I just want to let you know that I, I'm here on audio but can't seem to get on, on camera, so I apologize for that. If I figure it out, um, hopefully we can see each other soon. Okay. Um, Do you want to introduce the poll, Sophia? Um, sure. I th okay, perfect. Let me see. So what is your current role? I see everybody in the chat is letting us know where they're from, uh, what's your role. So if you can just go ahead and uh, complete that poll, what is your role? You can select teacher, you're a coach, a mentor, administrator, or observer. We would definitely like to know who is over there. Um, just to kind of get to know each other. So please feel free to complete that. All right, awesome. So we're talking to 58% of teachers, great. 23% of coach mentors, 13% are administrators and 6% class observers. Thank you so much for being here. We really uh, are excited that you joined today. Um, so moving forward, we're going to do a quick check-in. Um, we're just going to go ahead 
and see what is your program currently. So are you 100% remote? You do a hybrid? Or you are mostly or completely in person? We know that now with COVID time, we are all doing different things from different places. So take your time to complete that quick poll. And I see lots of you in the chat also replying. We have a lot of trainers and observers and coaches. Awesome. Tutors. Great. Okay, so 56% of you are 100% remote. Oh, wow. That is great. 26% hybrid and 18% mostly or completely in person. Okay, so a great variety here. I'm sure we're going to cover um, information and let us know if you have further questions. All right. So moving forward, let's see. So Veronica, do you want to um, kind of like dive in with me and let's talk about purpose of this uh, discussion today and webinar? Sure. So today we're going to be talking about practical ways that you can use what you already know um, related to effective interactions that you know and understand about the class and think about how we can best support dual language learners, particularly during remote learning and as children return to school. Um, so some things that can help us understand the context, we know that there are so many children who are DLLs in the United States. In fact, there's an estimate of 11.5 million and one in three children under the age of six speak a language uh, other than English at home. So there's one big myth about the LLs is that it's, it's rare and in fact, it's, it's not rare. Um, and 62% of DLL children are Hispanic in the United States, 15% are Asian, 6% are black. And the most common languages that are spoken by families is Spanish, then Chinese, Tagalog, and then Arabic. And we know from the work that is done within classroom context that most early childhood teachers have at least one child who's a dual language learner in their classroom. But many report that they lack specific training on how to support those DLLs in the classroom. So this is something very common that we all experience, but it's not something that everyone seems to have a good handle on you know, what to do to best support the children. Oftentimes language barriers could be an interference with DLLs being able to fully benefit in classroom interactions and in learning contexts. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing with us those uh, facts, Veronica. So let's dive in. And I do have a couple of questions for you. And I'm sure like as they come over chat or the Q&A, just um, I'll be able to send those your way. So first of all, what advice do you have? for teachers who do not know the home language of the children in their class? Because as you mentioned, there are several languages. What would be the best advice for them? Well, this one's, this one's an easy one, right? If you don't know the language of the children in the home, I would say learn it, right? So the children who are in classroom context are learning English and all young children in general are learning language, right? They're building the receptive and expressive language through exposure and you can too. Um, and I know that that might seem daunting for some of you if you have a classroom that have, you know, 12 or more languages um, represented among the children in your classroom. I don't mean that you have to become fully fluent or proficient in each language that's represented in your classroom, but I do think we can make an effort to learn some keywords or phrases. So, for example, one thing that could be done is learn to pronounce the child's first and last name correctly and their family's names, right? So some parents and grandparents may have traditional names that are unfamiliar to you. Making sure that you know how to say and spell their names correctly when you communicate with them can go a long way. It demonstrates respect and that you value them, right? Another thing is words that they use for family members, right? So that when a child is referring to his uma or his abuela, nanai or babushka, you know that he means his grandma. Right. So so these words for familiar family members, um, we can also learn greetings and words that demonstrate respect in their home language. So things like hello, goodbye, please, thank you, you're welcome. Yes and no. Those those basic terms are are ways that we can demonstrate to the child that we are 
making an effort to make that connection with them in ways that are meaningful. Um, another thing is emotion words, right? So words for happy, sad, excited, frustrated, and make sure that we can connect uh, to children in that way. We can also learn the names for some of their favorite things, right? So the toys they like to play with in the classroom or materials or the area that they like to play with in the classroom, their favorite color, just something that is unique about the child that is their favorite. If we learn those words in their home language, we can really connect with the child in a way that can be meaningful. Absolutely. Well, those are great tips. And actually, like if I wanted to learn a few phrases that I could use in the classroom as a teacher, do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now we have so many options for learning um, languages and most are free, right? So there's lap, there's apps, translation websites. We can even use friends or colleagues to speak the language. Um, you can listen to music or audiobooks in the child's language, which is something you can do either on your own or, or even in the classroom with children. Um, if you have children that are verbal, you can invite them to teach you. Imagine how empowering it is, right? For uh, a child to teach their teacher, right? <laughs> that, that reversal could be extremely powerful for the child. And I'd say that the most meaningful way to learn the child's language is to connect with families. So think about the authenticity in that learning. Rather than learning generic terms from, you know, something like Duolingo, right? Um, you can learn directly from the child's home context. So Spanish, for example, there are so many dialects. So if, if you learn a word online, it may not actually be the word or the term that the family or, or the child use. Um, so using, using the family um, as a resource and valuing them as an asset in that way. Um, and, and when you engage with families to learn from them, the, the family's going to be, the, the language learning is going to be loaded with their culture. Um, and, and the families will feel valued. They'll see how committed you are to connecting with their child. Um, but just, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that there are appropriate limits, right? So I'm not suggesting that you use families as, as free translation services, right? I wouldn't rely on families to translate your center um or classroom newsletter we we have to be really mindful of not burdening families but value them and, and respecting them so we can engage them in yeah we can engage them in some meaningful ways um and, and making sure that they know that you've taken the time to try but but connecting with them as well to learn some phrases that are meaningful to their child awesome thank you and it's important that you mentioned that because that will take us to the next question that we have prepared for you so what are some ways that we can support language development and create a language rich environment for our dual language learners well right now we have some restrictions due to health precautions um, because of covid but my go-to for building that relationship with with um uh, building that language rich environment is is to engage with families like I said so inviting families to be a, a part of the classroom context um, in engaging with them to learn phrases that are comforting to the child that could not only contribute to the relationship but also contribute to the language um, richness in the classroom um, certainly books right so when um, we we provide books and materials that are enough authentic representation of, of cultures and home languages in in the classroom i know that we all have classics that we really like and sometimes we want to use translations of those books like for example brown bear brown bear i've seen that translated in many many different languages but that's okay to some extent but we have to make sure that it's not the only type of book that we have in the children's home language we um, want to make sure that there are books that were originally written in the home language by authors who are native speakers from that culture or country, because that's gonna be a lot more authentic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and an, another way is to label things in the classroom. So using visuals, right? Um, with words that are a consistent color for a particular language, there's a chapter that I can link to about poll strategies, which are personalized oral language learning strategies. And this chapter explains the progression of visuals that are specific for DLLs and it has pictures and a lot of examples. Um, and, and in fact, it has a lot of great information. It was written by Linda Espinosa and Elizabeth Magruder. Um, the, the chapter also gets into details about using gestures and real objects and pictures, um, songs and finger plays and chants. 
Um, and another thing to keep in mind for DLLs is that small group instruction is important. So when, when we say small group, it's not half the class, right? It's three to four children um, working with the children on, on instruction, providing them with individual previews, for examples of books, um, and also setting it up so that children have opportunities to teach each other is another way to, to make the classroom language rich. Great, that's awesome. And I'm glad that you also mentioned the importance of the families, right? How important it is for you as a teacher to engage with families. And that brings me to a question that we just got in our Q&A. So how can you like uh, strengthen that relationship with the families to support language development when the family does not speak English in this case? What would you suggest? Yeah, so I would say making an effort to try to translate some things into their home language using uh, a translation service online. It's not going to be perfect, but the family is going to see that you made that effort uh, to try to communicate to them. So anything that you have written up that's in English, just pass it through a translation service and give it to the family with, you know, an apologetic face and just say, you know, I, I tried as much as possible. I want to make sure that you can um you know hear what it is that 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 is happening in the classroom and that you know you're aware and that we're able to communicate so when they see that you've made the effort to try to put it through a translation service especially if it's a language that you don't have anybody else that can maybe proofread um they will appreciate that effort um that that you're making and then that can really open up that line of communication with families so that they understand that you know in one of the notes you can even you can write in english and then have it translated saying you can write things to me in your home language and i will make sure that i get it translated so that i understand you right so it takes some of that pressure off of the family allowing them to write to you in the home language or even speak to you with a translation app so that you can somewhat communicate with that family because that's that's absolutely critical absolutely yes and uh, a lot of our um the people here attending today, they're asking how to do that virtually, right? So you can even use like different apps today, like you mentioned. So I feel like everybody can engage in some way with the families. Which brings us to the next question. Um, so as teachers, what are a few things that we can do tomorrow to improve interactions with our dual language learners? So if I would say it depends on, on whether you know the home language, right? So if you know the child's home language, um, you can engage in play using the home language, right? So you can observe them during their play, describe what they're doing, using lots of details and asking questions um, to ensure that their home language is not something that you're just using um, to correct behavior or to just, um, you know, engage with them in an academic way, but also through a fun, meaningful, engaging way, bringing that into their play context is absolutely important. If you don't know the child's home language um, and the child is verbal, you can even go to the child as they're playing and say, can you teach me how to say block in Farsi, right? Like mm -hmm. engage the child in that process of teaching you, um, take the time to pronounce it correctly, practice it and then use it. Next time the child is playing with blocks, you go and you use that word within the context of their play. They're gonna feel um, just very connected to you as a teacher because you're making that effort. Um, if the child is not yet verbal, something you can do is take a picture of them during play and then try to learn some phrases to describe their play in their language. Look it up online, um, show the picture to their families and point to objects and ask them for words that potentially connect to that play. You can share that observation with the child's family, even if you only know a few words. Let's say you only learn the word for block, right? You, you quickly mm -hmm. translated that online. You could show the family, you know, say the child's name and say the word for block, and they'll see that you're making this effort to connect with them in a meaningful way. Um, and again, it's, it, for me, it's really about making language learning playful and fun, right? Um, we, we often think about um, you know, teaching language um, in, in a didactic way, and, and that's absolutely important, but it's e equally as important to not just focus on language in a narrow sense, right? Um, mm -hmm. We can think about, um, you know, teaching language and exposing them to language um, in, in a broader way. So in outdoor play, during physical development, pretend play, meals, music, routine, science, math, 
all of these contexts are opportunities to make language fun and meaningful for children. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's great. I know there are some um, interests to around families. I know we touched base on that previously, but this is a question that came to us a lot. So what strategies, and I know you've touched base on this, but if we want to be very specific, what strategies do you suggest for building a relationship, focusing more on like the emotional support, right, that we need to give to our children and how we you strengthen that relationship again with their families? What would you say? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's sort of what I started to say before that we're we're restricted to some extent because of COVID, but my go-to is to engage with families as much as possible. This could still be done remotely, right? Of course, it's better in person, but via Zoom, you can engage with families in meaningful ways. You can ask them about phrases that come for their child. That's going to contribute to that relationship. If, if the family knows that you are trying to say words in the child's language, in their home language, that is meaningful to the child that family is going to feel a sense of like okay you care about my child you are invested i appreciate that right um teach their peers so it's not just about taking the home language so that you can connect with the child but but bringing that language into the classroom making that part of your instruction and, and in the way you greet each other encourage them to to use each other's language um, is great. There's also another um, great uh, family inventory that, that's in that chapter as well that I mentioned about the poll strategies um, that, that gives you suggestions on questions that you can ask families to really get to know them as individuals, right? A, a big part of um, meeting the needs of DLL children is to get to know their backgrounds, their experiences, abilities, their interests. And when they're young, we learn most of this from families. So to understand a DLL child and to really gear your instruction to meet their individual needs, engaging families is, is particularly important. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And actually just thinking about myself, I was a dual language learner in South America learning English, right? And I remember my mom constantly repeating also like words in English. She wanted to report in English, like, hey, don't this tattoo journal? Like, where is your journal? Like to just write it down. So I felt like that relationship between teachers and families really helped me later, like to develop, um, you know, more knowledge about English. So what you're saying is super helpful. And uh, this is a question that we have right now. So preparing for our next question, if we can just go to the next slide. Um, so for COVID, right now there is, uh, you know, we're all facing COVID and this is a valid question. How has COVID virtual learning and socially distance learning impacted uh, dual language learning, their families and the teachers? How has this impacted us? Yeah, so to make social socially distance learning work, there's a pretty big reliance on communication. If there's a language bar barrier, that could be really hard. But as I mentioned, technology is our friend, right? Um, it can help with translation. There's so many free translation websites. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but families will see that you're caring enough to make the effort to be connected to some extent. Um, if if a child, if a family has a child at home um, and they're engaging in distance learning, it's really hard to balance caring for the child. I'm, I'm experiencing this firsthand. I have a toddler at home and as challenging as it is for me to find that impossible balance, I also recognize that a lot of families have a much greater challenge. Many don't have jobs that they can do from home, right? So some children are being cared for by extended family, siblings, friends, neighbors, whatever. And they aren't getting some of the routine and certainly not the social interaction benefits that come with group care settings, but I'm not worried that they're not learning English. Uh, you know, in fact, I've mentioned that um, in, in, in so much of, of the work is that this idea that English only emergent, immersion is what's beneficial to children. And that's one of the biggest myths that has been debunked consistently by research. We find that continued and intentional support and development of their home language is the most beneficial for English acquisition. So language begets language, right? Um, mm -hmm. if, they, if they continue to strengthen their home language, that's going to contribute to their overall learning success. So, you know, these kids are at home in their home language. Yes, they're not maybe progressing in English um, as much as, as they would be if they were in a school-based context, but I think we really have to reframe our perceptions of, of children's home language, right? If we think about children's home language and families as assets, then what we should be in doing is encouraging families to engage with children in their home language, right? Um, there's that initiative, talk, read, sing, and I would add play. 
Um, and they should do all of that in the language in which they're most comfortable um, because this is the best way to support their child's development, right? I, I wouldn't tell parents what to cover, but rather just interact with them, talk with them in authentic ways. Um, and, you know, just personally, I think there's too much emphasis on the skills and objectives that were not developed with DLL children or diverse children in mind, but that's a, that's a topic for another day. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Veronica. This has been very helpful. And like you said, play, you know, just have fun, um, these little apps. And actually, this brings me to the question sections because I do have a few and I think uh, we can just talk a little bit about this. Um, a lot of our, uh, you know, the, the people here right now, they're asking that you mentioned a chapter in the book by the author Espinosa. Um, what is the name of the book and if you can also like highlight the resource title because a lot of them are interested in that resource absolutely so i am going to share it right now so that um it can be it can be um liz i just shared with you the link to that chapter in addition to the poll strategies website that you already shared so that you can go ahead and put that there um, it's an excellent resource that walks through the personalized oral uh, language learning strategies um, and, and really breaks down the not just the what to do, but the but why to do it and how to do it. So it's it's a really valuable resource um, mm -hmm. to to check out. Um, it's a chapter of a much larger book. The, the entire book is excellent, but this chapter in particular really gets into a lot of details. We'll make sure that we link it here um, in the chat, but also um, when we post the webinar or send the follow-up slides, we'll make sure that you have access to that chapter as well. Awesome, okay, perfect. Yeah, that was, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Sophia, to interrupt. I did put in the chat the poll strategies um, page, but Veronica, I don't think I got your the name of the book, but uh, we will add that in the um, email that goes out tomorrow if we can't share it now. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Um, so yeah, that was the question that everybody uh, had uh, a lot of questions here. There's another one, and I think we do have a little bit of time to, to discuss. Um, let me know, Veronica, how this is asking, Alison Harris is asking us, how can she support feedback loops for children who do not speak the same language she does? Uh, that's such a good question. Thank you for asking. So one thing to keep in mind is that um, we don't have to speak the same language and oftentimes children's receptive language develops um, for, uh, before their their ex expressive language, right? So their, their receptive language, they understand a lot more than what they're able to say. So oftentimes when we're speaking to children in English, they're able to respond to us in a contingent way. We may not know exactly what they're saying and that's why the reliance on pointing and gestures and pictures and objects are so important. So for example, if the child is building something with blocks and they say a word that you don't understand, um, make some gestures with your hands. For example, maybe the child is telling you they're, they're building structures very high, you know, lift your hand up, use gestures and, and ask a questioning motion, right? Say, do you mean tall? Does that mean tall? And just sort of look at the child's nonverbal responses. Maybe they're smiling or their eyes light up and they nod their head. Um, in agreement that lets you see, okay, we're we're getting somewhere here in this communication. So I would say that when you know when we don't speak the same language, relying on pictures, gestures, facial expressions can allow us to have back and forth conversations, even if they're not always verbal, right? So we can still model that contingent responding, that waiting, that serve and return, right, among the children and keep a conversation going, even if we're not quite sure that you know, we're, we're understanding each other. That continued exposure and that interest and in modeling the process of language um, is just as important as modeling the, the actual words that are being said. Wow, those great tips. And actually this one is, uh, this question is associated with what you're saying because um, Nildred Fayad is actually saying, there is a concept in choosing only one language when working with children with language delays. Is this a misconception? Yes or not? What are your thoughts around that? Um, yeah, absolutely. So there's no research that suggests that learning more than one language contributes to or causes a language delay, right? So 
certainly children who are learning more than one language may be delayed. And there is some research that says that some children who are DLLs that are learning two languages simultaneously might say their first few words um, later than the average child. But once they do start speaking, they typically catch up in terms of their grammar and their syntax and their word use once they do start speaking um, when they're learning more than two languages. And this idea that a child has a language delay, so I'm going to drop one of the languages so that I don't confuse them, there really isn't a lot of research to support that. Um, in fact, the research says that the more language exposure the child has, the better for their brain architecture, right? So mm -hmm. if exposing a child to more than one language is helping to develop their frontal lobe, you're literally contributing to strengthening the child's brain, having them have more synapses in their brain. So that continued exposure to language is only going to serve to facilitate language learning for the child. The child has a delay because the child has a delay, right? It's not because they're being exposed to two languages. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Veronica. I've had a great time, uh, you know, getting to, to ask these questions. Um, I know there's more to come. So I'm going to hand it off to Gloria uh, just to kind of uh, show us what resources we have next. So thank you. If, if we have some time, if there's no more questions in the chat and we have some time, I don't mind sharing a few more um, uh, you know, answering a few more questions from folks or or potentially just sharing a few more points that I think are important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. we have like over 20 minutes, so. Okay, Feel free. so I can, I can go on. <laughs> um, you know, one thing that I think is so important to talk about, and I'm glad that, that we have the time to talk about is, you know, when we, when we talk about DLL children, we often talk about, you know, what are the needs of a DLL child so that they learn English, right? And for me, you know, I, I think it's so important, and, and the research backs me up on this, in that we need to think about reevaluating our goal for children who are DLLs and not think about, you know, what do we have to do so that they learn English, but rather, what, what do we have to do so that they continue to learn language, both English and their home language. So, so that continued support of their home language and English, even if it means that it's the family at home and, and we're working with families to encourage them to continue to speak their home language at home and reinforce that. Because a lot of families feel this pressure to assimilate and they think that the way to make their child successful is to only speak to their child in English and fully immerse them in English so that they can you know, assimilate and, 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 and be successful in school. And in fact, the research continues to tell us is that, you know, when the home language continues to be strengthened as the child learns English, those children learn English better, faster, uh, at, at an increased rate than children who are just fully immersed in English and there isn't the continued support of their home language. So this messaging to families, you know, continue to speak your home language at home, bring the home language into the classroom, I think is so, so important. You know, if we think about affluent families, right, um, they are constantly seeking opportunities for their children to learn two, three, four languages, right? Private language immersion schools have long waiting lists, right? So when we think about it, it's because by, there is advantages to bilingualisms, as I said, Children who are bilingual have, um, you know, faster processing speed. They have um, uh, better executive functioning skills compared to monolingual English speaking children. So, so the more that these children are learning multiple languages, the more advantage they have in their brain architecture and their frontal lobe functioning, um, which later helps them, you know, helps them in their memory, that helps them in decision making, helps them in, in flexibility. So, you know, we, we want to continue to prioritize this um, and, and view their, their bilingualism or, or their home language that they're already coming with as a big advantage that they're bringing with them so that then we add English to that, not replace, uh, you know, replace it with English. Um, so, you know, there, there's, the, there's this focus on like, what are the scaffolds they need to learn English or be, so, so, you know, successful in English. But more recently, DLL experts who are much more immersed in this work than I am, thankfully, ha have provided us with a much better understanding of what DLLs needs, right? What are the mm -hmm. evidence or strategies that are effective um, that are appropriate for, for um, DLL children? Um, you know, and, and 
going back to the question about, you know, what are the, what are the things that I can do tomorrow? Another thing you can do in addition to talking to children within the context of play is take inventory of the books that you have, right? So think about the kids that you have in your classroom and what are the books that you have available in that language, making sure that it's not, you know, yes, some translations are good, but also, you know, are there books that have authentic representation of, of those children, right? Um, do you have books by authors that are from their culture, from their, their country? Um, if you don't have the resources to purchase books, I, I understand that. You can find read alouds on YouTube or on audiobook or even have a family member over Zoom, right? Um, tell or record an oral story out loud. It doesn't even have to be from a book. It's about exposure and immersion into their culture and, and bringing that into that classroom so that there is not only representation, but celebration of uh, that diversity in, in the classroom mm -hmm. context. Absolutely. Yeah. And I actually, I just had a very good question here coming in. A lot of great questions. Um, this one is about language in terms of, we often hear that children are language confused when we make a referral to speech and language. So as a teacher, how do we proceed when the child has very little language skills in neither language? Like, what would you suggest in that scenario? Yeah, if they have little language in either in, in, in none of the in either of the languages that they're speaking, um, I, I always advocate for early intervention and referral. So I would never say, oh, well, the child is learning two languages, so let's wait and see, right? Let's wait and see when they turn three years old if they catch up. No, absolutely. We know referrals take a long time and there's a lot of intervention that can happen. The the reality is that oftentimes when children have a language delay, it's not because of confusion in two languages. Um, it's because something's going on. They may have a processing um, issue. They may have difficulty hearing. So making sure that they get a hearing screening. I would still refer the child and not think, oh, they're they're going to catch up because um, you know they're they're bilingual. It might be, but it doesn't hurt to get the child evaluated and get them um, some of the services that might help with early intervention. Um, but what I would say is when you're thinking about the context of what you can do in the classroom in the meantime, because evaluations take a long time, um, you know, I don't think about language instruction in this very didactic way, right? You don't have to print out a bunch of picture cards and have children memorize the words, right, in order to help their language. Helping them learn language in a way that's active and fun can be really helpful. In fact, there are some studies that show the connection between physical play like kinesthetic movement and sensorial play and language learning so when a child is you know touching things and and manipulating um a sensory bin and moving and jumping and playing as part of that language learning we see a significant increase in their retention of oral language learning which is so interesting to think about right because sometimes we we say okay the kids need to play and then they need to learn but it's really when we merge those two when children are engaged in play and we bring language learning to their play in a meaningful fun way um is is so much more of an effective way to to teach absolutely absolutely that that's a great way to to see it and um i actually was thinking also about my own experience learning and this question that's coming next it's tied in to one of the resources you mentioned like choosing books right and when i thought about how did i learn better the language that i was you know at like spanish and english i had a book called coquito and this coquito book which has helped me learn and develop and I've seen so many references online now that parents use this book to teach their kids here in the States to how to speak Spanish. And so this question is, can you please recommend a resource where teachers can find some of those books that are authentic to children's um, home language? Is there a, a web page that you can recommend or somewhere that they could start looking for these books? Absolutely. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I'm picturing it and it's um, a website that was created by a postdoc um, uh, that she has active right now and, and she has some really good resources. Um, I don't know how many languages are represented in, in the website, um, but I do know at least there are books in Spanish um, in, in on that website and I will look for other resources that have a list of, of authentic books. That's actually something that I'm working on at the moment 
coming up with a list of books in, in authentic languages that do have that representation and celebration of diversity in, in a more authentic and meaningful way. So in the meantime, I'll make sure that I share what's currently available. And as soon as um, we put together that resource, we're, we're looking at um, diversity and inclusion in books around race, around culture and language, and around ability. So we're going to be compiling that um, as one of the, the projects that I'm working on, and I'll make sure that we share that with everybody who attended here today as well. But in the meantime, I'll, I'll make sure that I'll link to whatever is available at the at the moment. Awesome. Thank you, Veronica. And I do have a last question. It's about language modeling, class one. Um, can you touch on the importance of language modeling and how a teacher can use in the classroom to stimulate language development? Um, absolutely. I mean, when we think about language modeling, it's about um, using language so that children hear language and then also using strategies that are going to promote the child to use language themselves. So, so it's both things, right? It's giving them a model for language and also eliciting the child to speak. And the way that we do that is by um, bringing language to their play. I, th I think like my answers are going to be the same because I believe in it so passionately, right? So the best way to model language is not to decide what you're going to teach children, but rather observe them within the context of their play. What are they playing with? What are they interested? Okay, now take language to that play. Describe what they're doing. Label the things around them. Ask them questions. Engage in sustained conversations with them. Go back and forth with them. Um, you know, think aloud as you play alongside them, right? So, so everything that you do within the context of play, when you're using language, that automatically makes the language authentic and meaningful and engaging for kids, which are sort of like the necessary ingredients that we need in order to, to make language um, really stick uh, to the child. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you for your time. It has been great talking to you. Um, I'll, I'll pass this conversation to Gloria and see if she, it's okay to share additional resources. Thank you, I really appreciate all your knowledge. Happy to be here, thank you for having me. Yes, uh, thank you again to Sophia and Veronica. Um, to wrap this up, I'd like to share some of Teach Stone's resources that can really impact the work you are doing in your programs, especially in this time of COVID. Um, when teachers in particular are in need of extra support systems. First thing is the class learning community. We at Teach Stone understand the value of bringing educators together in a safe space where they can really learn from each other. Um, so if you want to continue this conversation, for example, in the class community, that's the perfect forum for it. Uh, it's free, it allows you to network with other educators, questions, share ideas, and really learn, right? Learn how other people are using class, how people are adjusting to COVID, really whatever you want to discuss. Um, it's really an educator-run space, so I highly recommend it. Um, we'll include that link um, in the follow-up email as well. Um, on March 23rd, we will be hosting our annual Interact Class Summit. Um, it will be virtual again this year. We're hoping to get back to an in-person conference next year. Uh, the theme this year is building back through interactions. So we'll be joined by hopefully you and hundreds of leaders across the early education industry to have inspiring conversations and tactical sessions focused on ensuring equitable learning opportunities for all children as we build back from a year of you know unparalleled challenges in the education industry. Um, early bird tickets are $150 until February 15th. Um, and I'll include information on the summit and how to register in the follow-up email as well. Um, trauma is a big topic in this moment. Um, it's it's always something to focus on, but particularly you know, last year and this year as, as COVID continues, um, Teach Stone knew that this was a topic that teachers and other educators really needed help navigating. You know, how do you teach children who have experienced trauma? How can I help them move through that trauma in order to improve the outcomes of that child? So we've developed a trauma-informed professional development series to serve that need. It covers a variety of topics, which you'll see listed here. Um, and you can also choose to supplement the training with a transfer to practice webinar. 
which will really help build your confidence around what you've learned in the training and how to implement that training. Um, and then we also offer an, emo an emotional support kit. This kit helps teachers promote children's ability to recognize and manage their feelings in the classroom. Um, this kit also contains classroom materials and an emotional support guidebook with interactive uh, reflections, planning tools, strategies, all to help teachers understand how the class emotional support domain is tied to children's social and emotional development. And then finally, if you're someone who wants to learn more about how class can help you, or maybe you work for an organization that already uses class and you're looking to improve your knowledge or your scores, um, our foundations course is an easy way for teachers to learn those core class skills. Um, it consists of four courses that are customizable and you can do them on your own time. Um, and you really get a deep dive into what class is and how it shows up in your classroom. It's a huge value um, and it's affordable. Also, we'll follow up with more information in the email after this webinar. Um, so all the resources that we mentioned today will be sent to you in about 24 hours. Um, but for now, thank you for joining us, Veronica and Sophia. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, and everyone, please be well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.